Hi, I'm Tony Poole from St. Luke's Church in Churchill, Maryland. Uh, I'm a lay Eucharist, Eucharistic minister there, and I've been uh, attending that church for the last 30 years. With me today is Father Todd Kassam. He is a new rector at St. Luke's, and uh, I'd like to introduce him and have him tell us a little bit about their 285th anniversary celebration that will be coming up in October. Good morning, Father Todd. Good morning, and thank you, Tony. Uh, we have an exciting event coming up. Um, on October 20th at 11 a.m. at St. Luke's Church in Churchill, Maryland. Um, 285 years of, uh, of a very active uh, parish, a wonderful parish. And St. Luke's Parish is a geographical area. St. Luke's Church in Church Hill, um, celebrating its 285th, um, also has an attached chapel in Sudlersville. And this program will have an opportunity to talk a little bit about that as well. But the um, the 285th celebration at 11 a.m. on October 20th has been in preparation with a committee around that and some activities, uh, uh, notably um, an historic church celebration, uh, a, a Eucharist, that would have been done at the time of 1728 and its founding. Uh, the prayer book in use dates from 1662, so in that style of language and uh, with some presentations and uh, showing that it's both um, deeply historical, but uh, also deeply contemporary and, and relevant to today and to the future of our church. Speak, um, speaking of historical, mm -hmm. I understand both churches are on the historical registry. They are. We're happy participants and members of the uh, Queen Anne's Historic Sites Consortium. Uh, that meets on first Sundays through May to October. So. This is your last chance to be a part of the tours on first Saturdays on October 5th. That's a different event, but uh, equally important. Over in the historic academy that was built in 1818, we'll have artifacts. We'll have our Episcopal diocesan archivist, Art Leiby, on hand to um, give a small presentation, or he's just such a wealth of knowledge um, about historic places and especially uh, the Episcopal Diocese and especially St. Luke's Parish itself that uh, um, you do well to ask him any question and then just enjoy the the amount of information and the enthusiasm with which he imparts history to you. So that's October 5th between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. in the Historic Academy on our campus in Church Hill. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Father Todd. I've Thank got a few me. other people here I'd like to talk to, so if you will excuse me, we'll bring in <laughs> the next person. With me is Beth Everett. Beth is our chair of the property committee for St. Luke's Parish, as well as being junior warden for St. Luke's Church. Beth, can you uh, give us a little history on St. Luke's and how it came into existence? Well, St. Luke's Parish was carved out of St. Paul's Parish, which was a very large parish that was uh, begun in 1692. And there were so many settlers upriver in the northern part of Queen Anne's County that there was no way one rector could possibly cover the whole parish and as a result the people up in the northern part of the county were worried about the morality of their children as we still are today and how they're growing up as heathens so they asked and were granted from the uh, Maryland General Assembly in 1726 permission to have a new parish in the northern part of the county. Uh, it, the one person who wasn't real happy about that was the rector of St. Paul's Parish. He thought that his money was going to be cut too much, so he held things up for a couple of years, and there was a little turmoil there. But in 1728, in October of 1728, the, uh, it was approved, and our true birthday is really December 1st, 1728, although we always celebrate it every year on St. Luke's Day this year. The 285th anniversary will be celebrating on October 20th on St. Luke's Day. Um, as soon as the parish was delineated, they hired a rector who turned out was of a more practical nature than most. He decided that he was going to have the church built and he would be the main contractor for it and he was in charge of 
the building of the church and as everything from the interior layouts to having the bricks molded right there on the campus in Church Hill. He signed a contract in uh, May of 1730, promising to have the church ready for occupancy by Christmas of 1731. And as usual with any construction project, there were some fussing and fighting and changes and we are not sure whether or not he actually made his contract of Christmas Day, but the records show that there was uh, a service in early 1732, so he pretty much made his contract. Um, has, has the church been active uh, for all 285 years? I'm just curious about what went on during the, uh, the Revolutionary War. And Well, for the most part it was. It, it had some ups and downs and you know due to the political turmoil and the drama of construction there was a lot of interest plus the fact that taxes were collected to support the church uh, it did very well in its first 50 or 60 years until the 1770s uh, with the rise of Methodism and these upstart preachers came into town trying to steal parishioners and reform the church, and that was definitely a challenge for Mr. Lang, the first rector, uh, along with the fact that in 1776 the General Assembly decided to stop funding the church and the clergy with taxes, so that was difficult. And then, of course, the Revolutionary War. Uh, when there's a war, the, the interest and the resources of the community are elsewhere. So we didn't completely close down like a lot of parishes did during that war. It shows, the records show that uh, the vestry met 27 times in that five years. So that's almost quarterly, so that's not too bad. But after the war, it was a tough time for St. Luke's because there was just no money and no way to pay rectors. And they came and went because they had a hard time getting paid. And in by the 1830s, the church was in terrible disrepair and the only, uh, inhabitants were hogs and cows and other livestock. And then uh, in the 1840s, the Bishop of Maryland came to visit, saw what a terrible state the church was in, and preached to the parishioners. He had to do it from the Methodist Church, but he so inspired them that they were able to collect some money, and he was able to collect some money to refurbish the church. The, the women of the church, the Episcopal Church women, I guess, back then, actually held a sale and raised almost $250, which was quite a bit of money then, and with the money that the bishop was able to give them, they were able to put a new roof, a new floor, and reopen for business. Speaking of, of the physical characteristics of the church, I understand it is, it is somewhat unique. Can you describe the building? Well, it's a very simple building, really, and I'm not sure it's all that unique. It's just that not many examples survive. It's Flemish bond, which means that there's a normal long brick and then uh, the short end of the brick, and what that does is stabilize the thickness of the brick wall throughout. So instead of having three brick walls, you have one big wall that has stood for almost 300 years. And then on the end is a lovely little chancel, which is almost spherical. It's round walls and a round ceiling, and it's quite lovely. A big window, so there's a lot of light. Uh, and in, uh, in the late 1800s, we had another benefactor, uh, George Williams. And he saw that the church was in disrepair again, and was, his family was from originally from Queen Anne's County. His family was active in St. Paul's Parish. But when he saw St. Luke's Church, he decided to help out and said that he would match funds to repair the church and bring it back to a place where it could be worshipped in again. And in the Victorian way, they installed uh, stained glass windows, they put a tower on the front, added the sacristy, added all sorts of dark, heavy furniture and moldings, and, and which all still exist. He also gave a lot of silver and that sort of thing, which can be seen on October 5th in the Academy. Uh, it'll be on display from 10 to 2. and. Then the church was refurbished once more, just a little bit in 1957, and sort of brought back to the colonial look, except for the tower, which was Victorian. And since then, we've just been trying to keep it together. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you.
With me now is Bob Campbell. Bob is one of the vestry members and is also the uh, junior warden of St. Andrew's Chapel. Bob, uh, welcome here this morning, but can morning. you fill us in on uh, a brief history of St. Andrew's? Yes, sir. Uh, in 1728, when uh, St. Luke's was established, the vestry at that time voted to put up a chapel of ease about 10 miles northeast of what is now Churchill. And it was called the Chapel in the Forest, but when it was completed in 1730, uh, they gave it the name St. Andrews. In 1772, approximately 40 years later, uh, they replaced it with a smaller wooden building. And by 1820, it became in disrepair. Uh, it was vandalized and interestingly used by pigs and sheep from the local farmers. Uh, it was dilapidated in 1841 and bricks to be used for St. Luke's, bricks and wood to be used for St. Luke's were used to repair St. Andrews. In 1880, it was relocated in Sudlersville. It was a, quote, charming little wooden Gothic structure and it was built by Richard Upjohn, who is said to be the nation's outstanding 19th century church architect. In 1953, it was extended by about another 10 feet to include choir stalls, and to the east, attached to the church, was a new parish house, which I may say is very, very active today. St. Andrew's Chapel had some restoration work done in 2011 by Mr. Tom Willie. Floor joists, due to water damage, needed to be repaired, which uh, assisted in, in helping the walls of the church that kind of sagged. And today we're on the National Historic Registry, which is open the first Saturday of each month, starting in May through October. And in a nutshell, Tony, that's the history of St. Andrew's Chapel. Bob, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming and telling us about that. Thank you, Tony. With me now is Dave Terry. Dave is also a member of the Vestry of St. Luke's Parish, as well as being Senior Warden of the Parish. Dave, can you tell us a little bit about what that entails? And also, one of the buildings we haven't talked about yet is the Academy, located on the St. Luke's Church campus. Can you fill us in on uh, the history of that? Sure, Tony. Thanks a lot. Uh, in 1817, a quarter acre of land was leased by the Vestry of uh, St. Luke's to the Churchill Academy trustees. And in 1818, they er erected a brick school building. It was the first public academy in Queen Anne's County. Uh, when we talk about public schools, we think of our public school system. This actually meant it was a, what we would call a private school. It, you had to pay to go there. But uh, it was not connected to a church, even though it was on the church grounds and sometimes it was even called St. Luke's Academy. It was still uh, a public school in that sense. It was leased by the trustees for a period of 99 years for $10 a year. Uh, this became a mixed blessing because often the trustees could not pay the annual rent even when it was reduced from $10 to $5 a year. On the other hand, in the 1840s and 50s, St. Luke's could not get clergy to come there uh, unless they enticed them with uh, also double doubling as uh, schoolmasters of the academy. Uh, in 1886, after the building had set vacant for a number of years, the vestry took over the building and turned it into a vestry house and Sunday school. Uh, it's interesting that for many years there was um, no other uh, a parish house on the St. Luke's grounds except for the academy, which is uh, I, roughly 35 feet by, say, 18 feet, something like that. Not, not a very big building to get an entire group in. In the 1950s, um, as uh, Bob Campbell already mentioned, St. Andrews built a parish house, 
and many of the larger gatherings of the church had to be held at uh, St. Andrews. It wasn't until the mid-90s that the uh, present and very modern and pretty uh, St. Luke's uh, parish house was built onto the academy and fits right in with it. It's a very, very attractive place. Very good. Uh, is, uh, can you tell us who's responsible for the upkeep on the academy? Is that still being rented out or... You know, does the vestry have control of that now? Vestry does have control of it. Uh, over time, routine repairs, maintenance, and use uh, of the academy have been handled by a variety of groups. The ECW, the uh, Young Couples Club, and the vestry have all contributed to its, to its upkeep and, and, and maintenance. Um, currently, the academy and the parish house is used for meetings not only by the church but also community groups uh, throughout the year. Some of them are, are regular meetings. Uh, recently, a 12-foot table and 12 hoop-backed Windsor chairs were purchased for the academy by the ECW. Looks very good in there. Um, I, I do want to emphasize uh, Father Todd had mentioned our celebration and also the October 5th display, that, that uh, display of artifacts will be in the academy, so. On, on October the 5th. October the 5th. But on the 20th, I understand that it'll be used as a nursery. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's multiple uses. I think that's <laughs> terrific. Well, David, thank you for coming in today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tim. back, Father Todd Kassam. Uh, Father Todd, can you uh, fill us in on uh, the final arrangements for the 285th celebration? Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you for moderating with our wardens the nature of uh, St. Luke's Parish here, and, uh, and how exciting uh, this celebration is going to be, how exciting it is for our, our community of St. Luke's Parish to be hosting this on October 20th at 11 a.m., uh, this 285th celebration. Um, I, I think that we're talking about living history and celebrating that in the future of, of St. Luke's. So I would invite everybody again to, uh, to come and be a part of that and, and, and appreciate uh, the, the deep history, um, the, the Eucharistic uh, chalices and, and Eucharistic set that um, George Hawkin Williams gave. Um, uh, on that, on the campus, is the 1883 beautiful Victorian home uh, that uh, to, to build, uh, George Hawkins Williams gave $1,250. Um, what that would be in 2013 dollars, I don't know, but it's a, just a, an incredibly generous gift. And, and, it's, a, and it's, it's beautiful, along with the church, which dates from a different era, and come and appreciate that. Um, and there are many rich treasures uh, among St. Luke's Parish, uh, buildings, campus, and most especially people some of whom are direct descendants of that 1728 era uh, set of families that, oh, uh, that are part of the parish. Yes. So again, the blog spot, uh, stlukes285.blogspot.com. And I invite people to uh, go there and, uh, and learn more about St. Luke's Parish and what we're about on, on October 20th. Thank Very you, Tony. Good. Thank, Thank you, Todd.